Welcome to The Criminologist, the podcast dedicated to educating and entertaining our listeners. We bring you subject matter experts from around the world and share the latest and greatest evidence-based practices and interventions to help individuals desist from a life of crime and delinquency. This podcast avoids stereotypes and biases in favor of the lived experiences of those we can best learn from. Now, please welcome the host of The Criminologist, Joseph Arvidsson. Hello and welcome to episode 107 of The Criminologist podcast. Happy to have you all with us today. Grab your listener passports as we are once again traversing the Atlantic and heading back over to the United Kingdom. I often sing the praises on this program of augmenting one's social capital. And as I often say, many, if not most of the principles that we promote for our clients can, of course, be applied to us as well. Recall our tagline, there's no them, there's only us. And I can tell you personally, my life has changed in so many positive ways since I have gone all in on growing my social capital. To recap for newer listeners, when we speak of growing social capital, it's all about surrounding oneself with individuals that will, among other things, provide you with opportunities in life opportunities to grow, opportunities which will indeed provide more opportunities. When I reflect on the connections I have made on this podcast, I can give myself a quick social capital assessment and tell you that it has ballooned since launching episode one 106 weeks ago as have the tremendous opportunities that have come my way since that time. I was introduced to our next guest through our old friend Edmund Flanagan. I have interviewed Eddie twice in the past for this podcast. Please go back and have a listen if you have not yet done so. And in his most recent interview, Eddie introduced me to John Reed. John Reed is the director of Tutus Online CIC, based out of Kidderminster, England. John's primary aim in his business life is to assist in the criminal justice arena and to improve the experience for those caught up in the system. John feels that by interacting with prisoners using music, poetry, small group speaking, and storytelling, he is able to help in a couple of ways. First, the mental well-being of the residents is improved by introducing a sense of understanding that the situation they find themselves in can improve and become more positive in the long term. Secondly, the act of forming a relationship with John enables the residents to accept that improvement is possible. John feels that in many people, this improved mental state encourages them to realize the error of their ways and also to avoid repeating the experience of the past upon their release. John is also known as the storyteller fella, so allow me to let John do what he does best and tell stories. Please enjoy my conversation with John Reed, and I will see you all on the other side. Well, why don't we start off, John, by you telling us just a little bit about yourself, your background, and the journey you've been on that has led us to this point. Yes, certainly will, Joe. Pleasure to meet you. And I'm sorry if you need an interpreter, but my accent is very firmly London. I was born in Chiswick in the west side of London 74 years ago. Spent my growing up years just uh, south of Heathrow Airport where my dad worked and married in 1970 for the first time. 
uh, moved up to the Midlands in 1980, divorced, remarried, and I've been living in Kidderminster in Worcestershire. You people say Worcestershire, I believe, something like that. <laughs> Correct. And here I am, 38 years married and uh, happily sinking slowly into old age. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. John, you are currently the director of Tutus Online CIC, also known as the Storyteller Fella. Tell us a little bit about this role in your life now, your your current your current business. Yeah, I certainly will, because we have in UK a company which you might know as a not for profit, but we call them community interest companies. So I always describe it to somebody that's never heard of what they are. I always describe it as a limited company with a heart. So whereas a limited company is uh, generating profit to pay to the shareholders, my business is generating profit to re-employ in the business for the benefit of anybody I, I choose, really. So in my case, the uh, majority of the work I do nowadays is aimed at the prison service. But that's grown over the last four or five years since I formed the company. Um, it changed from sort of care homes to considering what prisons might be like compared to a care home. And in fact, there are many, many similarities. So I run a community interest company that uh, is just me and two fellow directors. Under UK law, you have to have three. The other two do absolutely not a lot. And uh, I, it's more or less a self-employed um, proposition. So we don't make uh, a fat lot. We made £100 last year to carry over this year. Um, one of the advantages in the UK of having a community interest company is that as well as uh, a comparable company, which would be a charity, we can apply for grant funding from a variety of sources, whereas a limited company can't do that. So I, last year, was fortunate in getting some money from the big lottery over here, which enabled me to take poetry into prison. So I've no doubt you'll be intrigued to know about um, later on. Uh, and that's really, with COVID being what it's been the last two years, that's really what's kept my little business going. Well, thank you, first of all, for enlightening me. I have had the honor and pleasure of interviewing quite a few folks from the United Kingdom. So my my acumen is building around the sort of nuanced subtleties in our, our English language. And now I know what CIC is. And yes, that makes total sense for my American listeners that will, again, equate to what we refer to as a nonprofit. And yes, I am very intrigued about your, your work with uh, the prison service, which again, more in line with, with our audience. So yes, please do tell them some of the work you're doing with the UK prison service over there. I might say that only last week I had a, a, a Friday, I had a chaplain from one of the prisons in Florida on Zoom and was talking to him about the American prison system because I don't really fully understand it. And, um, uh, and it was most intriguing, but there were many similarities. So let, let me uh, explain to your listeners how I got to where I got today, as they say. So in 2016, I met a retired bank manager who had known previously many years before. And I met him at a networking event. And of course, we were chatting over the old times, as we said. And he was on the point of retirement, but he was uh, what we call a business connector. His job on behalf of the bank was to go around businesses in his area and connect like-minded businesses together. And when we chatted, he said to me, you know, John, you should really have a community interest company. And I asked him what, what one of those was. I never heard of that, Andy. What is it? And he, when he explained it to me, he went further. He introduced me to an accountant who explained how to set it all up and what to do and uh, also how to get it funded um, because I'm not a rich man. I wasn't then and I am not now. Um, and so I applied for a um, scholarship with the School for Social Enterprise, which, again, any of your listeners can look up on Google and uh, learn about at the SSE in the UK. And, in fact, it, it operates in a number of countries around the world, India particularly. And I went and pitched for a um, scholarship with them. Now, when I say pitched, they wanted it to go to the people that would benefit the most because they in turn were funded by Lloyds Bank and by the big lottery. And so I won a place on the course and um, off we went. And this was the most um, uh, life-changing and wonderful experience I've ever had because it was learning 
on an entirely new scale. Bear in mind this was 2016, so I was 68 years of age at the time. Most of the people on the course were 20s and 30s, so I was granddad. And uh, we all learned together. It was a really, really excellent experience, which I can't speak highly enough. Well, one of the girls on the course there, when she heard me talking, she suggested that storytelling might be something I'd be really good at. And I've never been told that. In fact, I've written pieces since on LinkedIn where um, one needs to be encouraged to do things through, through one's life. And uh, I don't remember ever being encouraged to do very much. Um, Parent-wise, I've not had a wife that really pushes me to do anything. Uh, you know, I just do it all under my own steam. Um, so we came up with the idea and we wondered whether it might sit well in, a, in an old person's care home residential care home um, and so I had a guy following me on Twitter who was a, a, a an influence in a care home chain of care homes and so I went to him and asked if I might try out this idea in front of an audience and he said yes so I went into a care home in Birmingham I stood up in front of about 30 people all in their pensionable years over 65 um, some with dementia some perfectly compass mentis um, and I told them about my life and my mum's life because my mum was born in 1922, but by this time she had passed away. And we all like to live, listen in on other people's lives, don't we? We all like to know the idiosyncrasies, the things that have gone on. It's just human nature wanting to know why, why, why do we look at film stars and so on? Why are we watching Johnny Depp at, at the moment on YouTube? You know, it's <laughs> because we're all nosy. <laughs> so <laughs> it went very well and the one suggestion the guy said to me at the end was why don't you involve a bit of music in your story you know so we did another care home and we took music along we took a lot of old music from the war years um the big band era um america as well as as english and uh, and it really went very well and i of course tweeted about it um and right out of the blue a guy that at the time was the uh, prison governor for Leicester Prison, um, tweeted me and said, John, do you think this would work in a prison? I said, well, I've got no idea. I've not done it in a prison. So he said, well, do you want to come and talk about it? So I said, yes, please. I was intrigued because I'd never been in a prison. So over I went to Leicester and I met the rather wonderful and uh, advanced uh, man called Phil Novis. And Phil took me, as he said, John, come on the wing and meet the guys. So he sent me onto the wing of the prison. I'd never been before. And I met a load of men, and it wasn't what I expected at all. It was all friendly. I mean, there were guys there of all crimes. So it was arranged I would go back one Saturday morning and uh, deliver the story of Elvis Presley. Everyone knows Elvis. Mm -hmm. um, the night before I went, my wife said, what tracks are you playing? What music? I said, well, it wouldn't be me if I didn't play Jailhouse Rock, would it? So she said, you you can't play Jailhouse Rock in the prison. I said, why not? She said, because they'll riot. I said, yeah. How do you know? You've never been in a prison. But like all wives, they know best, don't they? Sort of. <laughs> so in I went, and I got taken to what they call the SEG. Now, I don't know what you call it in America, but in England, the SEG is where the naughty boys in the naughty prison, they're either put for their own protection or because they've done something terrible. I didn't know this. I've got no idea. And so started the story of Elvis with about 25 inmates. And while I was doing it, um, the, the prison officers decided to raise a cell that I could see through a side window. And they turned up in helmets and stab proof vests and God knows what. They were looking for drugs. Found none, apparently. There were some guys playing billiards that I was watching. And I thought, if ever it kicks off, you know, I know what I'm going to do. And I was in there in this room with about 25 men and a couple of officers, and it was like having a party. It was wonderful. Um, and halfway through, one of the guys uh, got up and left the room. And I honestly thought I'd offended him. But as I was leaving at the end of the session, he sort of motioned me over towards him and uh, said, come here, come here. And I went across and he said, John, I'm really sorry I had to leave when I did. And I said, no, this is your home. You know, you must treat this place. As you see fit, I'm, I'm the visitor here. And he said, what it was, John, when you got to 1958 and you started talking about Elvis going in the army, he said, you went off at a tangent and you started talking about your mum. 
And what your mum did, and she was a dinner lady in my school at the time, and I was a pupil, and so I always got more dinner than everybody else because mum was serving it up at the counter. Wow. And he said, it moved me to tears, he said, and obviously in front of this group of men, I can't be seen to cry. And so I had to leave, he said, but what you're doing is wonderful. So this story got fed back to the governor. And the governor said, John, you know, you, you really hit some, on something here because what you're doing, you're taking these men out of their um, habitat, putting them in somewhere fresh. You're showing them that you care and others care and we all care to do something about it. And um, he really hit a tune. But uh, he said, you know, unfortunately, our prison is too small to give you a regular contract. However, we go on the second part of the story, which I'm sure you'd like to hear. Indeed. So he said to me, John, you need to go to Stafford Prison, where the governor there is the man who used to be my assistant here. This is another wonderful guy called Ralph Lobkowski, and Ralph will be able to help you because he has a prison of 750 men, whereas Leicester is only 320. And I realise these numbers are small compared with with, uh, America. However, off I went to see Ralph. And Ralph was the most accommodating man. So he asked me, would you be prepared to show me what you do? And I said, of course, you know. So we got about 50 of the guys in the chapel, in the prison, and half a dozen prison officers. And we did the story of Elvis again. The response was phenomenal. And uh, I had men dancing in the aisles. I had guys coming up to me afterwards wanting autographs. Um, It was just the best experience. And... I got invited back, given a contract to supply just six weeks of of, um, music. Um, And I got invited to go into what they call the um, SSG, the Senior Support Group. So in our prison system, men over 65 do not have to work in prison, whereas others would have to. They'd either have to work or be educated. Um, But these guys, it's like a care home within a prison, really. Most wonderful group of men. Um, what I haven't told you is that the 750 men that are locked up in HMP EPS Stafford are all sex offenders. Um, and your listeners might have heard of a gentleman called Rolf Harris, who was a really famous entertainer over here. He's an Australian lad, um, who was convicted of sex offending, historic sex offending. All of this came up post Jimmy Savile and the awful crimes that he committed. So the world of prison has changed over here quite a lot in recent years. Um, But I went in on a regular basis. I went into the family days, got to know the prisoners, got to know the families um, and supplied music and comfort and happiness and, and a feeling of I'll trust and respect you if you do the same for me. And this has a knock on effect into the mental health of all the men that I uh, work with in the prison. And during that time, I've been to very many prisons in the UK and delivered exactly the same program. And the responses we get are really good. So it's clear to me, and it's apparently an emerging clarity to the prison service, that if you treat people with trust and respect, you train those that are retrainable, you look after the ones in your care if they're old, you do whatever you can to help them, then at the end of the day, the reoffending figures should go down. The figures within prison for self-harm, suicide, poor mental health, all of these things should reduce. And if we did enough of it, we wouldn't need to build any new prisons because we've got enough already. I want to point something out to the audience, my longtime listeners in particular, and then I'm going to circle back and ask you a related question, John. So, again, longtime listeners of the show know that in addition to exploring those various pathways into criminality, we also love exploring those pathways out of criminality, and in particular, as they align with the emerging desistance theories about, again, why individuals desist from a life of crime and delinquency. But my point being, recall that one of those variables is what we often refer to as changing that individual individual's narrative scripts. 
And again, I've defined narrative scripts in different ways, uh, you know, depending on the generation. Sometimes it's the story you tell yourself in your head. For younger audience, I say it's the it's the movie playing in your head or the Netflix series playing in your head. But again, this aligns with what we we talk about as far as, again, changing that narrative script from one of I am a, uh, a shot caller, hooligan, thug, pimp to one of I am a father a valued employee, uh, a citizen. So again, I, I I can relate to what you're saying here, John, because again, even, and I know my listeners all know who Fergus McNeil is, but Fergus has really pushed the envelope on this as well, where he has actually utilized songs and songwriting for justice-involved individuals as a way of changing those narrative scripts. My question back to you now, John, is I love where you're going with the prison service have you explored and or have any of the governors, and again, for my American audience, governors, that's the equivalent to the wardens of our prisons. But have you looked at, again, John, maybe maybe workshopping this or, again, pushing the uh, the listeners of your stories to sort of reframe their stories to be more future focused on who – not defining them for what they have done, but rather defining them for what they may become? Yeah, I, I might say before I tell you uh, the answer to your question that I am never ever interested in the crime. I just don't want to know um, because it's irrelevant to me. The, whether they are guilty or innocent or whatever, whether they're on remand or whatever reason they're there for, it's irrelevant to what I'm doing. So I don't ask them. I must say that some tell me. Um, I had a guy say to me once, "Did you see me in your local paper?" And I said, "No." And he said, well, the crime that he was convicted of um, was reported in my local paper because he lived local to me. And I make no secret to the fact of where I live. So um, there we go. So, yeah, we, we pursue it and develop it. I must say um, the starting point really is, uh, and I, I, it would be good to compare this with America, the starting point in the UK is there are no votes in prison reform. No politician is ever going to take up the cudgel and say, let's do something about the prisons. They only see the solution as building more prisons because that's capital investment in the country, which an awful lot of people, especially with the Conservative government that we've currently got and had for some years, you know, the, the people that vote in a Conservative government are likely to want to see the, the country grow and do well mainly because they are business owners and property owners and they, they value their own income. And I don't, I don't blame them for that. that that's, that's a fair enough choice. But the point I made, you can't, I couldn't get onto my local MP and say to him, why don't you stand up in the House of Commons and shout that we should build less prisons, not more? Because he's never going to do it. Um, likewise, in the prison service, we don't, from what I see of American prisons, we don't have the automation that you have. So mostly prisoners are kept in close proximity to their prison officers and they are able to touch them and work with them and, and be part of their lives. This, of course, brings risks to the prison officer because if a prisoner attacks a prison officer, the worst that's going to happen, especially if he's a man on a long sentence, the worst that can happen is you'll be given a loss of privileges. Or some, you know, something akin to that. Whereas in America, you have these um, TVs watching everybody all the time. You have gates that open electronically. Uh, as far as I'm aware, you have some prisons where the prisoner need never come in contact with a prison officer. So that must limit the ability the ability to rehabilitate. But we try our best, and we try to teach people um, how to improve their lives so that when they leave, they have a better life. Um, and I have actually a, a story that I'll willingly tell you that we have a really major success on our hands at the moment relating to what we're currently doing. So if you'd like to hear the story, the guy concerned um, will be delighted to hear his story on your podcast because he's a real live man and uh, we're working with him at the moment. So um, we got funding last year to take poetry into prison because we were already taking music in and we're already taking comedy in, although very limited comedy, because the amount of jokes you can make in prison 
once you take it, all the things you can't joke about are limited. Um, but because I've done a little bit of stand-up comedy work for my own pleasure, um, the guys tend to think of me as a bit of a comedian, and, and that's okay. Um, and I take storytelling, of course, and I tell stories, whatever they want to talk about. Um, I make it very personal, so if they ask me about my own life and what I've been up to and how uh, did I get divorced and what happened there and da 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 you know, they love all this. So we got this thing to take poetry in, and I designed a course which made me go into one prison on six consecutive days, um, six Tuesdays rather, each week for six weeks, firstly to teach them what a poem was and then to teach them how to write one. And on the very first day, in came about 15 men, one of whom turned out to be Albanian and didn't speak a word of English. So needless to say, he only came the once, in spite of the fact that I took a poem that I had written and had it translated into Albanian so that on his next visit, he could actually read it and understand what we were doing. However, he never returned. These guys came in and we sat them down and supplied tea and coffee and biscuits and made friends. And we just chatted and chatted. And it was it was great fun, great pleasure. But one guy, the man I'm going to tell you about, is a gentleman called Lee Barnes. Now, Lee Barnes, on the very first meeting, told me that he was ex-military, that he was um, in the army, that he had served in Afghanistan, um, that he had personally killed five men, and he knew he'd done it because he shot them and he saw them fall. Um, highly trained guy, no longer in the military. When he left, he's suffering from post-traumatic syndrome, PTSD, as we call it, and... Um, he was under the prison surveillance for drugs, so he, they were being given drugs to deal with the PTSD. Um, and he was also an alcoholic, and he was attending Alcoholics Anonymous, and he was a man of about 38 years of age. So he'd lived. Um, in fact, he came in one day holding his hand up like this, and I said, Wait, where you been, Lee? Where have you been? He said, I've been to the hospital to have my hand x-rayed. I said, why? Well, he said, I broke it. I said, oh, how did you break it? Well, I hit this bloke, he said. I said, that's not good, you know. And he, well, he said, they put him doubling up in my cell. He said, and my cell is my home. And as soon as we shut the door, he started smoking drugs. And I told him to put the cigarette out or I'd hit him. And he wouldn't put it out, so I hit him. <laughs> and he said, of course, I got into the seg for that. But the man got removed and he said, I'm not having any drugs in my cell. So that, that was my initiation with Lee. The following week, when he came back, he came in with sheaths of paper. And he said, John, I must say hats off to you. He said, you have given me a fresh outlook on my sentence. And I said, why? And he said, well, the drugs they give me in prison to deal with PTSD keep me awake at night. And now... I can write poems in the night time when I'm wide awake. And I write love poems to my girlfriend. And in fact, you know, I have a number of his poems because they were so moving. They were so good that in the end, we, we did a little special something for him as a reward. However, he went on for the six weeks writing poems and enjoying himself and enjoying life thoroughly. So did the other guys. There was another guy in there who uh, wrote poems that were really very dark and very scary for me to read. And the reason they were was because um, he was what we call a, a, an IPP prisoner. He was imprisoned for public protection. So these sentences are no longer handed out. But initially he got two years for robbery, I believe, burglary, robbery, something like that, something fairly minor. But the judge who handed him the two years for that made it IPP. So when I met him, he had served an extra 10 years on his sentence. He has now been released. So I'm quite happy to report that. His name is Lorenzo. He's a good man. However, returning to the story of Lee, um, on the very last time I went in there, I had asked the prison officer, could I take them in a reward for being such a good bunch of lads? And he said, what had I got in mind? And I said, chocolate. And he said, yes, you can bring them in chocolate. 
So I went to our discount uh, supermarket and I bought a load of chocolate, took it into prison, and I handed each man a uh, milk, bo- milk chocolate bar and a dark chocolate bar because I didn't know what they liked. And they rode with the moon and we got chatting and it was a bit of a party really. Um, and I said to Lee, Lee, have you ever abseiled anywhere? And he said, well, yeah. He said, I was trained to abseil out of helicopters into the war zone. That's how I got shot at and where I shot my my men. I said, how would you like to do it again? He said, well, out of a helicopter? I said, no, no, no. My community interest company is associated with, and it's because of Ed, um, Edmund Flanagan, this is, we're associated with a charity called Effie's Bubbles, and we are willing to support somebody to abseil from the Olympic Tower in the Olympic Park when London had the Olympics in 2012. Again, your listeners can view this on Google. It's it's a, it's a, an 80-odd feet high tower. It's coloured red, and it's on the Olympic Park. Um, so what I was trying to give Lee was hope, hope that when he was released, which he was last month, he would have something to look forward to. And so he said, yes, he'd be up for that. So that was it. So fast forward, if you like. He got released. I lost track of him. I'd got no idea where he was, except I knew that he'd be under our probation service. And so through the prison, I located the probation office that was looking after him. And they, of course, are not allowed to give our individual details, but they could give Lee my details and so it was about 20 past 10 one Monday evening my phone rang and there was Lee on the end of the phone I can tell you I was so relieved and so pleased to hear from him that he was well he was out he was living in uh, approved premises in Tamworth in Staffordshire and um, yeah he was he was much nicer well much better place than he had been Uh, And so on Saturday, May the 21st, I don't know when this podcast is going to go out, so it may have happened by the time you play this. But however, um, Lee will have done it. And if anybody wants to see the results of what Lee has done, I will be putting it all out, photographs um, and bits and pieces uh, on LinkedIn. So there we are. So it should all it should all work very well. Um, But this is a new start for Lee. Okay, so on May the 21st, Lee will be abseiling from the Olympic Tower uh, on the, in the Olympic Village, as was, um, and raising £275 for Effie's Bubbles, which is a, a charity that aims to put research into uh, germ cell cancer, which affected Effie, and in fact, it more than affected her, it cost her her life at the age of three and a half. So he is delighted. I am delighted. We will work with him now. He will stay a firm friend. Um, He's wanting to go back into prison with me and explain to the guys that are in there what a great outcome, if only they'll just engage, if only they'll just do it. Because there are men out there that will think, ah, poetry is not for me. But it is. It's for everybody. It is for everybody. This will drop on May 14th. So listeners should be able to mark their calendars to watch that drop on the 21st. You mentioned the the installation of hope, you know, as an ingredient. We all know from the assistance literature, that's a big thing in the change process, just giving individuals hope. And along those lines, John, maybe touch on the role that you feel mental health plays in, again, these pathways out of criminality for for incarcerated individuals and again what how what you're doing is is improving uh, on that mental health as it were yes i certainly will um i hadn't realized some years ago my wife had a bout of depression anxiety call it what you will and i was not a good husband to her because i didn't fully understand it but having done the social enterprise course another lady on the course there was a lady who supplies charitable work to one of our main hospitals in the Midlands, um, a women's hospital. And she funds this by, she is a qualified mental health nurse herself, and she delivers mental health awareness courses. And so she felt 
because of what I'm doing, it'd be a good idea if I went on it. So I did. And this ran over, um, during COVID this was, this ran over four long Zoom sessions. Um, and I learned a huge amount about mental health, not in curing it, because I realised there isn't an easy cure, but in recognising the symptoms and how to handle those symptoms when you're confronted with a person that is uh, obviously displaying those said symptoms. Um, and so I found that going into prison, a great number of people at least suffer anxiety, at the very least, um, especially if it's their first time in, especially if they are people that have supposedly committed the crime many years before, as we have with these historic sex offenders. You know, we have people going into prison where the crime was committed in the 60s and 70s. Uh, no doubt you have as well, but but that's what we see here. Um, and it enables me to talk to these people and to just sit down and chat and empathise with them and suggest things we could do to help them get relief. And Lee's example of poetry writing in the middle of the night is a really good example. But loneliness in prison um, leading to mental health problems is another serious problem. And that's really where my journey started all those years ago. You know, I recognised that lonely didn't necessarily mean that you were alone in a room. You, you could be, um, I have a granddaughter just gone off to university. She can be lonely in her room at university, even though there are hundreds and thousands of students around her. She studies at, at Birmingham University, um, and there are thousands of students there. Um, but she doesn't necessarily know many of them, and she easily could be lonely. And certainly if I was locked up in prison for a crime, um, hopefully never will be, but if I was, I feel very lonely because the first night in prison uh, must be a really strange night. Um, we had uh, just recently, we had um, Becker, the tennis player, um, lost his freedom in the UK um, for a fraud crime. Um, and there's a guy with millions of pounds of money and a very rich lifestyle all his life, um, loved by people who love tennis. They must have loved Becker. Um, and what would, what would it be like for him on the first night, you know, Ignoring the crime, how what would I say to Becker on the first night in prison? Difficult to think of words. Yeah, I grew up watching Boris Becker play tennis, to your point. But exactly, what would that first night in prison be like for Boris Becker? I, I spent four years working at a business that was not two miles from Wimbledon tennis courts. <laughs> you would have seen Boris Becker play there and commentate there in later years. Yeah, exactly. And it wasn't until the day I changed jobs and moved up to the Midlands that I went anywhere near tennis because I don't like tennis. <laughs> Say, you mentioned our mutual friend, Ed Flanagan. Listeners will know Ed the Head Flanagan. He's actually appeared on the Criminologist podcast, not once, but twice. Talk about some of the work you're doing um, with Ed. I know you've got one, if not more, projects going on with him and how your sort of universe has collided in a, in a great way, though. Yeah, I certainly will, because I love this man to death, and I know he reciprocates. You know, we work so well. So I didn't even know Ed until the beginning of last year, beginning of 2021, when Ed wrote to me on LinkedIn and said, I love what you do. Can we collaborate? And I tend to say to most people who say this to me, yeah, let's do a Zoom. Let's have a chat, see if there's any common ground. And so I arranged this Zoom with Ed. And it was the most wonderful meeting of minds because we both work similarly. And so he started sending me videos that he put together. He's done videos of me, my family, my kids, or whatever pictures you send him. He chooses the music. And, of course, lots of other people. I no doubt he's done one for you. Um, and a variety of people that I've introduced him to, he's done. Um, the famous Andy Mullaney, who was the guy that introduced me to CICs in the first place. He um, ex he's now retired from Lloyd's Bank. But he still goes around and introduces people, and, and uh, he's written a book, um, which it, uh, he'd be a good guy for your broadcast as well because his books really sow the seeds of how to get through life. You know, the he treat treat life as a game, and then you'll see what you can do. You know, um, so what do we do together? Well, what I found was when these guys started writing poetry that Ed would take a poem and convert it into a video. Hey, 
that's something I can't do. And so he did it. So then we took um, apparatus into prison amongst much security, I might tell you, to get the video up on the screen for the man who wrote the poem to watch the video. Oh, wow. Oh, my God. You you should have seen the results. Um, the, the first one that Ed did for Lee, um, Lee loved it. But the first one he did for my other guy, Lorenzo, uh, because Ed had voiced it himself, they didn't like the tone of the voice. Mm. So they loved the poem and they loved the video, but they wanted my voice on it and not Ed's. So we re-recorded it and made a second one, and they love that. And then we have a arts festival that happens in prison once a year, which I had myself been in the previous year, which happened over the television network. So we have a network designed to deliver education into prisons, and the network is known as Way Out TV in the sense that if the men watch it regularly and learn from it, they will get a better way out of prison, a better way out of their criminology. And so I was asked by the lady that organises it, the rather lovely Dr. Jackie, um, who works from Leicester University, um, would I make a two 10-minute videos that she could include in the festival, which I did, and also Ed did one himself. And this, um, I think probably we're halfway through the second run of it now. It runs for eight weeks. It started in January. Um, late January, early February, I think, where so they put out eight weeks every Sunday evening for half an hour. The program goes out, and it has not just our stuff on it, but other people doing other things. Um, and then once they run the eight weeks, they run it all again for another eight weeks. Um, and we get feedback from the men um, to say, you know, we really enjoyed it. So now the men in the prison that I showed to write the poems can not only see them on the video that Ed's produced, but they can see them on their own television set in their own cell, their own pad, as they call them. And so, again, it's giving them hope for the future. It's giving them something they've done um, that they can be proud of. And all of this stokes up their mental health. It all helps. Every little help, said the old lady, as the saying goes. Um, I did. Uh, do you know the second half of that by any means? I do not. Would you like it? Yes, please. You may have to edit afterwards. Okay, let's give it a shot. Every little help, said the old lady as she peed in the sea. <laughs> I think that'll pass muster. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I need to have uh, in the future, John, both you and Ed on simultaneously. I would love to get you two in a room talking about all the great work you're doing together. And now I need to assign myself some homework and do a little bit of research around Way Out TV. That sounds absolutely fascinating. It doesn't go to every UK prison. We do actually have prisons with their own TV network, but they tend to be large prisons. Now, how that compares with what you call large, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But um, there are prisons out there. And, in fact, uh, HMPPS Hewell, which, uh, again, you can find it on Wikipedia and, and all over the place, learn all about it. It's a general prison. It's got everybody in there from shoplifters to murderers, you know, they're all in there. Um, it's got about, and the next cohort of men we're going to do actually would be a good time to talk to you again. The next group we're doing are, as far as I'm aware, all ex-military. And as a result, you know, we should get some really good poetry written and some really good uh, uh, improving stories of the men. Um, so they have got a bid in for government money at the moment to install their own TV network. Um, because what happens is once they've got the network in, they train the men to write the programs, to produce them, to run the mechanicals of it, lighting, sound, you know, all the things that go to producing a TV program. Um, so men will learn a new skill because they've got their own TV station. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, so there's loads going on. So I'd be delighted to appear with Ed because he's my mate. He's a good man. He is the greatest. In fact, he introduced me to you and or suggested that I, I have on the program. So I owe it for that as well. So let's uh, let's set that as our goal, John. John Reed, director of Tutus Online CIC, the storyteller fella. John, thanks for being on the program, and I look forward to having you back with Edmund. Thank you. 
a big criminologist podcast. Thank you to John Reed. And I will have John back on the show with Ed Flanagan. Can't wait to talk to both of those two individuals simultaneously. I'm also going to leave some of Ed Flanagan's YouTube clips in the description of this episode. If you want to go ahead and check those out, I encourage you to subscribe to Ed's YouTube channel. You could just do a YouTube search of Ed the Head Flanagan and see his really unique artwork. You've got to check out the work of Ed. You will be impressed. Back next week with a fresh episode. In the meantime, you may contact the show or reach out to us through our website, the Paragon Group, LLC.com, for training or presentations as to core correctional skills, implementation, program design, or, of course, the topic of desistance from crime. Hey, speaking of core correctional skills, Registration opens tomorrow for the second annual International Training School on Core Correctional Skills, once again taking place in the lovely city of Barcelona, Spain. Join me and Ion Dernescu from the University of Bucharest in Romania as we bring you a, an all-star cast of trainers, up to and including our very special guest, Fergus McNeil, will be joining us. So, if you want to do more than just get out your listener passports and get out your actual traveling passports, I encourage you to check that out. I will endeavor to leave some information in the program description of this podcast if you're interested. Or, of course, reach out to the show for more information if you have any questions or comments as to this podcast feel free to contact us via our email of the criminologist podcast at gmail.com that's the criminologist podcast at gmail.com remember to follow us through our facebook page and instagram page at the criminologist podcast new fun images are being added all the time to those feeds you don't want to miss out Hey, we're also on Twitter. The Criminologist Media Group can be followed at Crim Media Group. That's C-R-I-M Media Group. Go ahead and give us a follow. You may also connect with me or John Reed on LinkedIn and follow both the Criminologist Podcast and the Paragon Group on our LinkedIn pages. Hey, lastly, if you've not already done so, check out and subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Criminologist, for additional content as to the themes of this program. Merchandise is available. If you're interested, reach out for details. And if you believe in what we're doing on the show, if you're part of the movement, please spread the word. Tell a friend or a coworker or a colleague about us. Ask them to subscribe to the podcast. And of course, do so yourself if you've not already done so. And always remember, folks, there's no them, there's only us. Why are we watching Johnny Depp at, at the moment on YouTube? You know, it's because we're all nosy. <laughs> Recall our tagline, there's no them, there's only us. The Criminologist Podcast is a production of the Paragon Group, LLC. For speaking engagements, interviews, program design, or training opportunities, please visit us at theparagongroupllc.com. If you enjoyed the show, you can find more content and videos on our YouTube channel, The Criminologist. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Both The Criminologist podcast and The Criminologist channel are brought to you by The Criminologist Media Group. Be sure to give us a five-star review, and thanks for listening. The thoughts, statements, and opinions of the host and cast members do not necessarily reflect the views of their employers and are those of the host and cast themselves. Any discussion regarding client statements, behaviors, actions, or crimes are purely fictional and are used only for the purposes of example. Any examples that could be deemed to be related to an actual individual or individuals are incidental.